It's been 32 months since the rebar of the deep foundation of Starship's orbital launch mount began to rise above the ground, and it looks like it's finally getting ready for the fateful day, the first Starship orbital flight. The fact they're removing equipment from the OLM is the biggest sign. Besides that, the scaffolding was also removed. There appeared to be lots of instrumentation and multiple electrical junction boxes that went around the outer perimeter of the OLM. All of that shielding they wrapped around the circumference now has to be kept cool for some period of time. Some pipes were frozen, but appeared to have flanges removed from the ends. Maybe blow cold N2 into that space during the active period of launch? Cooling and flame prevention all in once. More notably, the newest staircase added to the OLM, which was halfway built running up the launch mount, was removed from the launch site altogether. After that, new shielding is added to the Starship orbital launch mount legs again. My take is that the removal of the stairways means SpaceX couldn't finish them, covering them with blast shielding before the orbital launch attempt. That effort could have been done in a few weeks. Actually, we are now past the promise of an orbital launch attempt month from now for the last year holding pattern, and now going into a hard countdown. And if this is true, Booster 7 may be headed back to the mount soon. By the way, SpaceX has long road closures from Monday to Wednesday this week. Amongst other noticeable milestones, SpaceX is quickly building the Deluge system. Last weekend, the second large pipe for the water deluge system was lifted into place. Imagine how much water SpaceX would need for a cataclysm. It's going to have one hell of a pump. According to the draft PEA, SpaceX considered whether deluge water would discharge on the plume during a launch or test. If water were used, most of the water would be vaporized. If treatment or retention of stormwater or wastewater is required, SpaceX would retain the water in retention ponds adjacent to the launch mount. SpaceX would determine the exact number, location, and size of the retention ponds within the VLA based on quantities of deluge water and final site plans. SpaceX would develop appropriate sampling protocols and water quality criteria in coordination with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TSEC. SpaceX would remove water-containing contaminants that exceed the water quality criteria and haul it to an approved industrial wastewater treatment facility nearby. SpaceX would pump all other water not containing prohibited chemicals back to the water storage tanks at the VLA. If surface water discharge were required, SpaceX would apply for a TSEC Texas Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or TPDES, permit prior to the discharge event. All water, including deluge and potable water, would be either delivered by truck or withdrawn from existing or new wells located adjacent to the launch pad. Next, while SpaceX prepares for the launch of B-7 and Ship-24, Booster 10, the eighth super heavy booster, was fully stacked in the Mega Bay. Booster 11 is also getting a little bit taller there. Interestingly, Booster 11 was not on the normal stacking station. When stacking vehicles, SpaceX puts the sections on a motorized turntable next to a robotic welding arm. As the tank spins, the robot is able to access the entire circumference of the barrel. SpaceX has clearly doubled their stacking capacity for boosters in the Mega Bay with stacking stations both left and right of the doorway. Production is at an all-time high, so the bays need to accommodate that. SpaceX is clearly preparing all options, for as soon as B-7 and S-24 fails, they will have a successor. Meanwhile, the broken system at NASA is quite the contrast. Having just flown a significantly delayed first flight of an empty spacecraft on Artemis 1, it will be nearly another two years before the next flight. Artemis 2 will attempt to carry a crew around the moon in a redux of the flight of Apollo 8 over 55 years ago, using a system, the SLS rocket and Orion capsule, that is essentially the same as those developed 70 years ago. One might might expect it to be cheaper and more reliable given its heritage, but no. In reality, the opposite is true. Indeed, the difference between a winner and a loser is that the winner gets back up, learns from what they did wrong, and tries again. And if you can recall, Mr. Musk has focused on the number one rule, blowing up new and untested rockets to learn how to make them better. Better yet, he and his team are actually applying, rather than ignoring their data, to make sure that the next rocket ship is safer. 
This is where he and other new space companies have a distinct advantage over their government competitors. Their process is complete when they deliver a highly reliable, low-cost, reusable space transportation system that actually works. A good way to spot a technology edge crossing company that is a bad investment is one that does not have this built into their budget, either through overconfidence or naivete. A potentially successful company combines vision with pragmatic pessimism. They err on the side of expecting early failure, and their budget includes funding reserved to try again until they get it right. Thus, to these companies, the optics of failures do not matter as much as the application of lessons learned from those failures, be it satellite companies, government customers, or eventually, citizen space pioneers. There is no inherent conflict in the success metric for a private commercial space transportation provider. It delivers, or it does not the market handles the rest. And so, as critics and competitors wail at his failures, Elon has rolled out, blown up, rolled out, and blown up half a dozen test vehicles to get to the point he and his SpaceX team are at today. Now, for the last part of today's episode, India's most powerful rocket launched the final 36 satellites for OneWeb's first generation internet constellation on Saturday night, March 25th. An LVM-3 rocket, or Launch Vehicle Mark III, lifted off from India's Satish Dhawan Space Center Saturday at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, carrying 36 OneWeb broadband satellites toward low Earth orbit. About 90 minutes later, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, announced that all 36 spacecraft had been deployed successfully into the intended orbit, a circular path about 450 kilometers above Earth. The satellites will raise their own orbits over the coming days and weeks, finally settling in at an altitude of about 1,200 kilometers. Saturday's launch was a huge one for OneWeb. It was the 18th and final mission devoted to building out OneWeb's first generational broadband constellation in LEO, which before Saturday consisted of 582 satellites. This launch will be one of the most significant milestones in OneWeb's history so far, with the launch adding an additional 36 satellites to the OneWeb fleet, the first ever completed global LEO constellation. OneWeb representative said in a pre-launch statement. By completing the constellation, OneWeb is taking a pivotal step forward in delivering global coverage, they added. Most of the 17 previous OneWeb launches were conducted by Russian-built Soyuz rockets operated by the French company Ariane Space. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine back in February of 2022 sundered that partnership, impelling OneWeb to find new rocket rides for its satellites. The London-based company soon did just that, inking deals with both SpaceX and New Space India Limited, or NSIL, ISRO's commercial branch. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets launched three missions for OneWeb, which is interesting given that Elon Musk's company is building its own broadband constellation in LEO called Starlink. Saturday's liftoff was the second under the NSIL contract. The first in October of 2022 was also flown by an LVM-3, which is also known as the GSLV, or Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle Mark III. The 143-foot-tall, or 43.5-meter, LVM-3 is India's brawniest rocket. It's capable of delivering 17,600 pounds, or 8,000 kilograms of payload, to low Earth orbit according to its ISRO specifications page. And unfortunately, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.